just started recording. Oh, okay. So there's 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 a couple of uh, places where you know, I can't really near terminus. And, oh, that's that's Yogi Bear Park. But there's a, another place where um, you go around here, and there it's. Uh, it, it's 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 sort of like real funky Bill. I mean, you got the, the levee on one side, on the other side, you go down to the farmland, and there's these sort of the rickety little places, uh, super rundown trailer parks, and, right. and, and other things. You know, so, you know, something with a lot of character. Not not a place you'd like to live at full time, but you know, going to it's kind of entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Hey, you're bringing back a lot of memories to me, Mike. <laughs> you, you a know, lot of boating well, out there. Oh, well, see, I don't have a boat. I've never been on a boat out there, you know, and so I've I've, uh, I've, I've had this out for what six years, and so uh, it, you know, I guess boating's a is a hobby that we just didn't uh, think that we'd be getting into. We just bought a house here, so but. Uh, you know, like any other place, there's lots of interesting places to go to off the beaten path. You know, like yep. in, yeah. in Santa Barbara, you know, I used to, you know, in, in Santa Barbara, you know, I used to go to all sorts of places. Um, uh, and they don't show it very well here, you know, up the foothill, you know, East Mountain Road. Yeah, there we go, right there. Yeah, Mountain Drive. Yeah, I used to I used to bicycle that all the time. Mike, you have strong legs, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know, just I don't know, just stubbornness maybe. In, unless you have an electric bike now. No, no, I don't. You know, and I started out. Um, you know, I, I progressed. You know, and I used to go, and and one of the things that fun things you used to do is go from Santa Barbara to Ventura and get a, a taco on the uh, the wharf here <laughs> and then go back. Mm. You know, so... Uh, nice and cool along the coast. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it was. But, uh, you know, don't do that uh, too much anymore. So, Mike, you're, you're, you're sitting in an air-conditioned house, right? Oh, you bet. <laughs> yeah. what, what what was your high temperature today? Oh, uh, it was a, a close to 100, maybe a little bit less. But we've you know we've been up much higher. Um, it's kind of interesting that sometimes we'll be colder than you guys, and other times we'll be hotter. I mean, it just seesaws. You know? But uh, so, Dick, Dick, how, how's the weather in Paso Robles? Oh, it's hot. We, we hit the century mark today. We were over century, probably about 102, maybe somewhere around there. Yeah, it's been really pretty nice up until about a day or so ago. And then it got really hot. Uh, but that's typical this time of year. Yeah, that's, a, that's a dry heat, though. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not, it, it, it has been sultry a few days, but it has been pretty good this time. It was real dry today. Yeah. Do you find it? Uh, do you find it? Uh, you can do things in the morning up to about ten or eleven o'clock, and then things shut down. Yeah, you know, I took a bike ride today at about. Uh, I'm going to say it's probably around ten, and uh, it started getting kind of hot when I got back. Uh, but it was it was okay. We had fog this morning. So, and I don't know when that came in because I was shooting. Uh, I shut down at about 12.30 last night shooting. So uh, it must have happened in the, in the meantime. And I didn't see really any problems with the, the shooting when I looked at the data. So. so has anybody got something for show and tell tonight here? I have a couple of things, but I don't want to hog the whole thing. Uh, okay, let me get off your stop share. Okay. Hey, Tim. Hey, how are you? Jerry disappeared there. Yeah, we had Jerry, and then he, oh, he, his thing is still there, but he somehow lost. 
Yeah, he tends oh, to have to reset his computer at times. Aha. Uh -huh. Should I wait? Or yeah. Probably get going. going. He'll, he'll get catch going. up with us. Uh, I'll show you what I'm working on right now. Um, there, I got the, I, I took the 24 millimeter out again, and I took the tilt platform and I figured out with a star atlas, I've got like a little rectangle for the field of view. And I, I oriented that towards the Milky Way. And I think I came up with an angle of 63 degrees. So I figured that's not right. It's got to be 90 minus that. So it's about 27 degrees. So I still set the tilt platform 27 degrees and shot uh, with Alpha Scuddy in the middle. And this is what I got. This is just a raw stack. I haven't done anything to it yet or anything like that. There's been nothing done at all. But that's basically this Sagittarius side right here, going all the way up to uh, probably, I think that's Altair right there. So you're just a little bit of past Aquila and you can, uh, if we zoom in, you can probably see some things in here. Uh, what, sorry? What brightness uh, a sky do you have? How, how what now? Brightness of the sky. Oh, he beats the heck out of me. <laughs> Whatever you, you want. I know. But there's there's the lagoon, there's Triffid, there's uh mm -hmm. the swan and the eagle right there. So it's got all of the main you know features down there in that lower elevation or the lower part. This is some of the stuff that was in the way, the tree hydrate. And uh so that's basically, and I, I, like I said, that's just a that's just a pre-processed uh, deal right there, nothing else. Um, now, what I'm working on now is uh, the um, North American Nebula. I'm going to do a mosaic with the NP one twenty seven IS. So this is the first panel I just finished last night. So the idea here is. I think I centered it on this star right here. It's some HD star. And so I've got the North American going this way right here. So long, again, long, uh, long axis of the sensor is gonna end up being the short axis of the mosaic when it's done. And I'm gonna do the Pacific coast tonight, which is this direction here. And then I'll come back in, uh, uh, in a couple of days and do the Pelican side over here. So that's basically what I'm going to do with that guy right there. Um, and uh, I've got 36 panels each on that right there. My yeah. biggest regret on the <clears throat> four millimeter is getting enough panels. I mean, getting enough frames and, and being able to, I haven't been spending a lot of time looking at the data. I leave the camera on there. See, I don't want to move that camera. But I think what I'm going to end up doing is probably taking the memory card out of it so that I can, as I go night after night, I can look at the data and make sure that I get enough. Because one, one night I had to just throw the whole thing out. It was just so crapped out. I just couldn't believe it. Hey, hey Dick, when you, had, when you were showing the Sagittarius, uh, the Milky Way, yeah. uh, it, it, you displayed that it was a horizontal. Uh, right, yeah. And you rotated it. Is there a reason you rotate that like that? Yeah, yeah. What I like to do is I want to get it long axis of the sensor aligned to the Milky Way. That was done on a purposeful. Uh, I was done. I did that on purpose. That's why I got the tilt platform so that I could tilt that. Uh, in at my latitude, I think it's twenty three degrees. I mean twenty seven okay. degrees. And so I just tilted it so that I could get the entire Milky Way. Now, why? Because most of the stuff is there. I mean, when you think about it, all almost everything you could you could think of from an object standpoint is going to be right along that Milky Way line. Uh, so that's kind of what I was trying to I was trying to cover the most bases that I can possibly cover. And the, and the sensor the sensor uh, is is better in in this aspect than it would be vertical. Oh no 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 I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it's going to be any more sensitive. It's not going to do. The, the idea here is to get as much of the axes of the Milky Way as I can. 
Ten no, that's what I meant. You get more width. Now you, you could get, probably go diagonal with it if you wanted to. You know, you yeah, you could. Could look yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you did it that way. Uh, and uh, the reason why I chose not to do that is I want to try to get as much as I can on either side. So yeah. if you start okay. to do that, then you lose, you know, the tail and the and the head yeah. of it. Is but the center, that. the center, you get more width uh, with the center in this in this uh, aspect. Yeah, I get I get more of the Milky Way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 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 That's uh, what I was trying to, trying to do with that shot right there. And and, and uh, I've had, I mean I've had this problem before where I tried to orientate it by hand. Well, this yeah. time I got scientific, and I went into the Star Atlas, and I've got like a little rectangle that represents a 24 millimeter field of view, and I just positioned it like that until I could get it, you know, the way that I yeah. wanted. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And then the other thing that I did was uh, I purchased uh, a, a printer because I got so doggone tired of trying to deal with printing. I, I was going to Walmart and they got this same day photo thing, you know, there. And uh, I went there to try to get a print and the print uh, ended up taking me two weeks. And this is kind of what oh. I got. Okay. And I put this on. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I can show it to you. Good enough to get the whole thing or not. Because it's got <laughs> there. But that's basically the, um, the pipe. And I used a foam board. Okay. Yeah. On this guy yeah. right here. Well, the problem with this stuff is it's, it has too much give. All right, and so I creased it in this corner and bubbled. And the other thing too is I tried to fit it exactly to this 20 by 30 and it was a 20 by 30 by print. You don't ever really want to do that. You want to always uh, oversize the print and then, or whatever, and then cut the board after. I found this out the hard way. Now, let me show you what I got that I think is better. And I got this from Art Graphics. It's a company back east. This board here is what they did with this. Is it's like uh, instead of that foam stuff, which is really pretty spongy, almost like foam rubber. This is a looks like a styrofoam in the middle, and then they've laminated it with some kind of a wood lamination on either side. <laughs> kind of think of it kind of like gypsum board, you know. And then one side is uh, has a uh, adhesive on it, and it's adhesive back that you can pull that off right there. Uh, I cut this down on a table saw, but the table saw was kind of dirty, so it screwed up the back of the thing. <laughs> well, okay. Then I found out uh, what normally they do is they take and they cut these guys. They cut them down with an exacto knife. That's why you oversize the print, and they just use the edges of the board. This is this gator board, by the way, is the name of this stuff. And it's hmm. a hardback gator board. It's not the soft stuff. You want hard so that when you start to put this thing down, you can press this thing down really good. As a matter of fact, I used to, ended up using a rolling pin. Uh, you take the adhesive back off. When you do this, you want to peel from one corner. Okay, you start in one corner. You get the print the way you want it on top of the gator board. Then you peel over one corner, maybe peel about four or five inches off. You know, you fold over the, the print and you peel that corner off, maybe four or five inches off of either side, okay? And then you take the print and you tack it down on that little part right there. Now you know you've got that thing oriented the way that you want it, see, all the way across. Then you pull the print over the other way and you start pulling that adhesive back off. And as you're pulling that adhesive back off, you're pressing down that print all along the way to get it over and get it nice and flat. And as you just keep pulling that out, so you don't get any air bubbles. This one's got, this guy here's got an air bubble in it. Uh, I couldn't get it out. You know, I was trying to do this thing as I was going along. You can't do that. Once you get this, to, to start putting this thing down, you just got to roll with it. Then hey, once get, I got, you know the, can I make a comment? Comment? Oh, go, go ahead. Uh, what I was going to say is once you get done with that, once I got done with that, I took the adhesive protective back and I stuck that on top of the print 
and I used a rolling pin. Uh -huh. I just kind of rolled it down as good as I could all the way across just to make sure that I got that thing down. Now, I tried different ways of cutting it. Cutting it with a table saw versus uh, cutting it with an X-Acto knife, cutting it uh, on the print side versus cutting it on the back side. The best thing that I found, take a straight edge and just cut it with an X-Acto knife on the print side. You want to start with the print side. So what you can do is take that adhesive back, see, and put that right up against your uh, straight edge, whatever it is, uh, square or whatever. I use a square. And I just, and, I, and then you just start to cut along that line. And the benefit of that will keep you from getting a ragged edge, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I got with the, with the saw. So let me show you what I got. Now, this is a matte finish. This was done with the printer that I got. And it's beautiful. It has a very nice color to it, uh, much more like what you've got with the actual drawing. There's no glare. It's all matte finish. This paper was a uh, five mil paper, uh, Canon uh, matte finish paper. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I, I really That's good. Yeah, I really like the way that it came out. The printer is a, an HP 24 inch roll feed. Uh, it is a T210 is the, is the model number of the printer. And the reason why I chose the HP, the only other one that was, was uh, you know, down there in price under a thousand dollars was the Canon. And the Canon had a uh, ethernet connection, but no Wi-Fi, and the HP had both. And I think the only thing that it didn't, the HP didn't have is, you know, it's probably one of the slower ones, but I thought it did a wonderful job. Hmm. I put okay. it on high res print and, you know, what- Let me make had. a, let me make a comment. Um, I've always, when I, back in the day, I would do very large prints, black and whites. And then I'd glue them down to large pieces of uh, prepared cardboard for backing, which worked very well. But I always had trouble with adhesive back things. And there's a, a medium that's referred, I think it's called iron-on paper. Mm -hmm. And you put it between the print and, and the backing and you put a towel over your print and then you use a hot clothes iron to run over the whole thing. And it sort of melts the glue or the bonding, the wax in between. And you get a, a very good bond uh, that is no bubbles. You don't yeah. accidentally pass up and leave a bubble behind. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, this didn't have any bubble the way that I did it. Okay. Uh, it, it was because, and, the, and I think one of the reasons why is because of the way that it's done. You start at one corner you yeah. tack that corner down, and once that corner's tacked down, then then you're okay. If you start to try to shift that thing around as you're putting it across, you're going to get into trouble. You're okay, but I always left bubbles. So. Yeah, I, I I was doing that too uh, uh, until I did this technique, and it just it just okay. You, if you go as you keep going along, you just roll it down and so no, it's it's down it's down no air. You guys, you guys know the the laminate trick that you can you can use with with uh with laminate when you're using contact cement and what you do rather than trying to paste one one edge down and then you know try to lay it down without getting bubbles in it you can put down any kind of stick like you can use bamboo sticks uh uh small balsa strips any kind of little stick that you want and you put you lay it down every every couple of inches and wow. then you you what you go ahead and and completely adhere one edge. Now, when you get to the next stick, two inches away, you pull that stick out and you kind of, with your hand, you just kind of very slowly push everything down. And then uh -huh. you go to the next stick, the next stick, the next stick. Yeah. Now, with, if, if, it, if, it, uh, if it isn't, uh, if it's not stiff enough of a, of a, of a, a uh, picture, then it's gonna probably bubble on you anyway. But that trick really works with contacts. How do, you from, how do you keep from having your sticks glued in there? You, it, with contact cement, the contact cement doesn't stick to the, to the it just doesn't stick to the sticks. Okay. 
And you need the other side. The adhesion comes from both sides coming together. So okay. that's why you can very smoothly pull one out. Now, I don't know what kind of adhesive you have on, on one of the backings, but if you had the paper you're talking about, Jerry, and you could, you, uh, I know that it sounds like the hot ticket is the one you were using with the iron, but if yeah. you had a piece of paper that you could lay over uh, one, of the, uh, one of the adhesion, uh, the one, one of the adhesive strips, and you can pull that stick out, then you very slowly, you know, go from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. And it, it works really, really well with, with contact cement. But um, if, it, the, if the print isn't stiff enough, boy, you could really end up with some real odd stuff, you know, seams and all kinds of stuff. But it really works well. Now, the other thing I was going to ask, when you scored it with your, when you scored it with the knife, this material that you had, it sounded like it has wood veneer on both sides. And you scored it with, the, with your, your uh, knife. Mm -hmm. Can you snap it? Can you put it over a straight edge? You know, you know, I didn't try. I must, okay. must say I didn't try. I had it on top of some cardboard, and I just kept cutting and cutting until it finally broke through. Uh, now these guys that do drywall, I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. With, with drywall, that's exactly what they yeah, do. They just, yeah, you, you break it. Yeah, you break yeah. it. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Show, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could do that. You could score it on the one side and then just break it on the other side and you have Well, it. you're going to you're going to do a final trim anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, the way I the way you want to do it, I think, is you want uh yeah, you're going to have to trim it down somehow because the the roll feed printer that I have will not go uh edge to edge, you know. Yeah. And any way you look at it, you'd have to cut it down anyway because the gator board is only 24 inches. So if you went edge to edge, you don't want to be caught in a situation where you're trying to get the get the print right at the corner of the gator board. It ain't gonna fly. Yeah. Well, so. anyway, I thought I'd mention that laminate trick. It works great with laminate with with the you know contact cement. Regular yeah. adhesive, I'm not sure. That might yeah, be you know, it's kind of the same principle though. You're pulling out that adhesive backing. See, yeah, and that's yeah. kind of like the stick. See, and then you're yeah. just moving that along as you go along. You're pushing it down. So the, the, the reason I say the stick works, the sticks work so well is that, you know every two inches you're pulling one out, so you're very slowly moving across your sheet, and it yeah. it, it works really well. That's great, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, it's neat. Probably about a Gator. small print doing it. It's Speaking one you can throw away. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking about Gator Board, uh, that's what I used to put together the top cell of my 10-inch uh, Dobsonian and uh, also uh, parts of the uh, COVID scope. I, I had like about two four by eight sheets of uh, Gator Board that I came into possession of. And I, I've been using that. And it's been pretty rigid, but it, it seems to me that maybe the better type would be is the one with the wood on there and, you know, for a lightweight, rigid structure that will um, for, for making a scope. Mm -hmm. The adhesive seems real tacky, so, I mean... No, it, I would get the unadhesive, you know, and just... Yeah, it. this stuff seems really good. I mean, I was pretty pleased with it. Although when I first started to peel it off, somehow I managed to peel off the adhesive backing. Yeah. The adhesive from, from the actual gator board. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. going like, oh, okay. And then another one, the other thing is I got one of the boards that I got uh, doesn't have the adhesive on it. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that. And, and these things are not cheap. I mean, they, you know, they're Contact like... Contact cement. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've got yeah, that. spray contact. Some of the yeah. spray contact. Hey, there's an idea. I didn't think about that. Yeah, Ooh. but the, but yeah. some of them are really sloppy. You get you know, so they just like <laughs> just a, <laughs> but if you get the right ones and you're far enough away and you spray it, it's right. you let that set and then you spray the other side of the other one and then you can do the strict the the stick trick. Oh yeah, yeah. Because then wow. if they don't they don't stick to the they don't stick to the sticks. Yeah, that's say uh, say Dick the um, the 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 printer um, the ink. Do you have to worry about smudges from uh, wetness or anything like that? What, about what now? 
uh, moisture um, making smudges. Oh, on... smudges and so forth. Oh, because it's not going to have a, a glass over it. You know, I suppose there are some problems uh, that could be like that. But, you know, the way that I look at it is I, I hate to put glass in front of it, you know, because it, the glare is so bad and the structure is so intricate that it just seems like it's so much better um, without glass. Maybe and, a, a, like a Frylon or something like that. Um, I, you know, I would experiment because later on you might give it to some people and somebody might go, oh, it's dirty and use a wet rag. And Yeah, yeah. And I've had that <laughs> problem. Uh, I used to use, uh, back in the days when we had the film, they had this stuff that's called uh, Cetachrome. And it was, uh, it was a way of, of doing your own color prints. Uh, you know, add all these moisture baths and stuff like that. So, it, it, you know, back in those days, that's that's kind of what we had to do. And a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, I did back then, but I can't even hardly remember. Uh, and I think I remember that stuff that Jerry was talking about, where you iron it on, um, you know, and frame the stuff. But I can remember doing some of these things and not having anything in front of it. I had a picture of uh, fam a bunch of the family members. And my grandma had got, I got this from my grandma. Well, she had poked her finger on this thing so many times that it tore a <laughs> hole in this where each of us were. And they're that so and so and so and so. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured I'm destined for something like that, but at least I got my own printer. And you know, you think about it a painting, if it's uh, oil painting, there's not going to be any glass on that one. Uh, so, you know, if you've got to do it to that, it, why would you do it to uh, something that you could print up on a little printer? I guess the only water fast ink would be like uh, the Epson ink. Uh, Epson's not water soluble. Oh. What, what is this stuff called? Epson, Epson printers. Oh, They're Epson ink. printers. Yeah. They use a different type of ink. Uh, ink. Oh, yeah. Well, most of the inks I'm pretty sure are probably al aren't they alcohol based or something like that. So they're probably more or less impervious to water to a certain extent. But, well, I, I used to do my I used to have an HP printer and, and on gloss paper. That was a big deal uh, as far as um, smudging the print, you know, moisture in your fingers. So you had to be really careful with it. Uh, two yeah. comments. Two comments for you. Do you? One question is: Do you lose uh, detail with the matte paper versus gloss? You know, I've heard people. That's a good question because I've heard people say that, "Oh, you need to use gloss. It's the highest. You know, you're going to get the best resolution with, with gloss." And I, I must say, I prefer matte. Um, I, I guess what I'm going to say is this. You're going to get the same resolution. I think it's just whatever the illusion is on the eye. See, the second comment, mm -hmm. second comment I have on that, you were talking about putting glass in front of it. And I totally agree with you. Glass just is so reflective, it's horrible. But there's, there's anti-glare glasses. Well, there's, there. that's so one thing I'm, yeah, and if you, that's one thing I would like to get into, but, you know, when I looked at that direction, you know, they call the stuff anywhere, and then you get into it, and people say, well, it's not really that great. So, mm, I, I yeah. just don't, I, you know, I, I'm a little shy of going in that direction. Now, these guys uh, are pretty easy to work with. Uh, how am I going to mount it? Uh, they have these little uh, clips. Uh, let me go see if I can show you what these knives look like. Yeah, because the mat, the mat finish sounds like the way to go because you always get in trouble. And I think you're going to lose a little detail with the anti glare glass. So it's a tr it's a trade off. Yeah, the anti glare glass. The anti glare glass is just fine ground glass. So it now these it doesn't have a clear interface. You will lose some resolution with the yeah. Glare. That's what I. And you can't uh, let the yeah. glass touch the surface of the picture either. Well, the one thing oh. to think about is the size of the picture that Dick's printing. Nobody's going to be really close. You're yeah. going to be several feet away in order to appreciate it. Yeah. You know, perspective of your well, eyes. No, the, so no, the so uh, Max probably the, be better in that respect. The loss of um, 
resolution due to the matte surface, it uh, the defines is defined by the distance between the matte surface and the picture, not between the surface and where someone's standing. If you put it right on the picture, you get your best resolution. As the space gets where the mat moves away from the glass, you start losing, you know, because you're looking at it through a non specular surface. So it starts getting diffuse. And you and with color prints, it's pretty tricky because you can't, because of the emulsion, I don't know about printer stuff, but color paper emulsion, uh, you can't put that in direct contact with glass. It will gradually bleed the chemicals out and they'll run. What's the best, in your, in your mind, Jerry, what, what, what's the best uh, um, way to, to, uh, to display these? Like what, what uh, Dick was saying with the matte finish and just without the glass? Is that the best way to go? No, the matte, yeah, matte finish. Well, you can do it all sorts of ways. We have pictures here that are that. I tend to prefer the matte glass placed fairly close to the picture. You lose a little, but it doesn't glare. Yeah, the glare is horrible. Yeah. But my pictures are printed pictures, photographically printed. They're not um, printer printed. So I don't know about those inks and stuff. Yeah, interesting stuff. What I liked about the way the printer rendered it is it's very much like what it looks like on the screen. And uh, unlike what I got you know, from these guys from the Walmart, they kind of OD'd it. You know, they, they lightened it up a lot. And uh, I prefer to see a dark, kind of a darker, richer brown, like I got uh, from the from the screen version of the, of the pipe nebula. Maybe they were trying to save on uh, on printer ink. <laughs> no, actually, oh, yeah. I think it would have probably take. I, I don't know, but I would have thought it would, it would take almost more if it were a, a darker. But I don't know. I you know I, uh, or I mean, if they're uh, getting more more color into the thing. I don't know. Could you ask for a proof? Could you, you ask? No, I no, I doubt it. I mean, this is supposed. This is a kiosk brand type of thing. See, you go to a kiosk and you put in your memory yeah. stick, and you you go from there. What I didn't like about it is that you know they're saying same day. Well, it took two weeks, and that's when I decided. You know, if I'm going to be doing this stuff, I need to get more control over the printing. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have some problems. Well, well, there has to be a coordination between the computer and the printer. And I don't know, guys that are in photography, this is a big deal. That, so your colors represent what you see on your screen. And if that's not coordinated properly, you get what you got commercially. Because this, what you saw on your screen, the, the, the printer did not represent properly. So I know that's, that's, that's a big deal for, for guys there's in photography. A, uh, there's, a, there's a parameter in Photoshop, probably in Pix Insight too, that it, you need to set. You can't leave it on standard settings, but it represents what your picture is going to look like when you print it. And you have to put in the type of inks you're going to use and the printer name or certain properties of the printer. And then it will register uh, what, you, what you see on the screen you will get mm -hmm. on the printer. And I forget the name of that parameter. The gambit. That's it. Thank you. What? what? Gambit. Gambit? Yeah. Yes, and there's, um, for, for those who really want to make it super accurate, um, and they do sell them through uh, places like Woodland Hills Camera, they got a, looks like a, a thing that kind of like hangs in front of your monitor and takes a color. It's a gambit. Uh, I'm, I'm looking in this book. Hold a second. Uh, oh, so it's like a photometric color palette. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. It's not, this book is not showing uh, Photoshop <laughs> astronomy. But there, um, there's a couple of them that attach to your computer and you hang it in front of your monitor and you're able to figure out the gambit that you're getting with your monitor with some test strips. Yeah, the and gambit is what mm -hmm. matches your printer to your screen. Yeah, right. Yeah, if that's you the don't... dynamic range of each of the channels. So you're calibrating yeah. your screen to the to the, the image. Yeah, because well, you're, you're, your you're screen has a different, your... a different dynamic range and it has different um, resolutions and 
the screen parameters don't print well unless you um, adjust, calibrate your gambit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Is it a grayscale? It's more complicated than a yeah. grayscale. The, okay. the, uh, the, the gambit of a, a monitor is like a, a thousand to one or 10,000 to one on a piece of paper. You're lucky right. to get 10 to one, you know, type of. Uh, uh, Con, it's not contrast, but light levels, I guess. My, Mike, is this the book you had, the Photoshop Astronomy? Yeah. $598. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I glad I I didn't, on that I'm glad I didn't. At least you could get a couple of seats and fix it. Oh, well, hold a ah, second. Ah, well, ah. Well, hold, hold a second. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's because it's by William Bell and they're no longer there. Yeah, maybe I should be right. Oh, that's right. Okay, well, here's here's another one for you. Image processing, AIP, um, uh, by William Bell. And I had, when I moved, um, I, I had two versions of it. I had the original one that uh, they did, and the second one, which is really, a, it's a really great book on tells you how to, um, um, yeah, and, uh, in the, in the process. but but here here's the here, there it is down below there. The, oh. But but then anyways, um, it, it come it comes with software AIP. It's a derivative of the original <laughs> book which I have. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> oh boy, I've got some really old stuff that's probably worth a lot of money now because. <laughs> I, okay. I think I paid thirty dollars for my copy of that first book. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's the first book, CCD Camera Cookbook. Okay, that came with software. Then choosing and using the CCD camera. Uh, right here. It's green. It's confused with the background. That's right. Okay. Yeah. You got to turn off my background. Second here. Bye, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none. Okay. Okay. So you can. Okay. So there. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So the first book he came out with when I talked to, you know, talked to him uh, about video astronomy. So this is the first book. Okay. And he came out with some software that he wrote in Visual Basic. Then choosing and using CCD camera. And then finally, astronomical image processing, which is the precursor to the image processing book. This is the one I have, which is the second version. Now, the, the software was free in the first ones, but on the later ones, they made you pay a license fee. And if they had the special thing where you had to go, there was a, a a uh, special magic cookie number you sent to them and go, oh yeah, and they checked it to make sure the cookie number wasn't used, then it's in the back room, which enabled the software. Okay, so this was like about an $85 book. Um, Richard Berry decided after uh, William Bell went under um, that he was going to make it free. And so he rewrote the software. It's but you can get AIP for, for free. Um, and so now uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. It um, does a lot of things that probably the newer ones do, um, but um, I've been trying to teach myself um, with lately. And, uh, and uh, so it's people AIP, uh, for um, .io, you get into the group, you join it, and once you join it, you can download all all the files, including AIP4, which is the, uh, the software. And if I can sh uh, share the screen, I'll show you what it looks like. Mike, I just want to mention that your voice is kind of foggy. It's a little okay. bit dimmer, okay. dimmer than other people's voices. Okay, well, I'm going to have to get a, a, a microphone. Okay, so I don't know if this, I don't know what you're seeing here right now. 
Okay, so this is the... And we're not sharing yet. Oh, we're not sharing yet. Okay, hold a second. You are, it says I am sharing. We're getting uh, a blank. Well, I see. Okay, I see something. Second. Yeah, I do. Okay, okay, hold a second. Let me go back here. I, I, there you go. Okay, so, um, and it's hard for me. I've got all this other stuff in the way. Me so, um, so it's got your basic, get out of the full screen so I can get through that. Okay, so um, it, it's, it, no, that's right. Um, whoops, it just, it just, okay, it's a little buggy. What can I say? But one of the things, uh, the, the reason why I was trying to relearn it is because lately I've been having problems again, stacking my software. And so this is kind of a raw image. Um, this is- You mean uh, stacking your images, right? It doesn't want to, uh, I can't get um, like Deep Sky Stacker or another one to stack the images. And I'm wondering, um, the, this is this is through the this, uh, the C11. This is a raw image right here, and um, I'm wondering if these stars are just too bloated. Um, la the last night I was out, I was trying to focus it. Um, I was ha having um, the scene was so bad I couldn't use the button off the mask. I had to use the full uh, app maximum. Type of thing. I was just wondering, does this seem like these stars are too bloated to to, uh, to stack? It could be. I mean, when you have stars like that, either your focus is really off or you've got no, terrible speed. No, the scene. focus. That's the that's the that's the best focus I could. Yeah, you got bad seeing. Oh yeah. Well, that's you could, you, there are techniques that you can use to improve the size of the stars. Yeah, but that's after you stack it. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that you can't do anything there. Yeah, yeah, so here's the here's my attempt at the eagle. Uh, well, I won't say you can't do anything. You can do some things, but you need to have you know something like Pixit Sight, um, and then you can use something called distortion correction, and that will help some with star imaging. But your yeah, best bet is something called deconvolution. Yeah, but see, um, you can see here that at F10 with a, with a, a C11, um, I am just getting large stars, um, even. Mm -hmm. yeah. Previous nights. You know, you could try stacking them, though, and just see it, it, if it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't um, work. Okay. Yeah. Now so, your 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 scene must be terrible. It is. Star stars that big. It is. Yeah, and the guiding looks fine too because everything's round. That's right. So your guiding's not a problem. Yeah. So uh, yeah. at least at least I get a, a halfway decent image. Uh, well, that's a that's a longer exposure. But Shoot, is that, is that, you need to head up into the mountains. <laughs> if that's easier said than done around here. It's about a hundred miles. Is that away. M13, Mike? Uh, no, um, that is uh, M11. M11, okay. Yeah, I was uh, reduced the exposure just to get the different stars. Mm -hmm. Like this is, you know, uh, this is outside the dynamic range of the camera. Right here, you can see where you know, yeah, uh, the different uh, colors of the stars. So this is what I'm. This is kind of what I'm up against. And in, in, in do you stuff. have that kind of seeing problem all the time, or is that infrequent? What's that bad? Uh, it's you, that's this is the norm. Okay. Oh, so this, okay. Okay. So this is and this is the light. This is the light pollution I I have to contend with also. Okay, so uh, it's moving because I yeah. had did the wrong. Wow. Yeah. The, the stars are round. Yeah, the yeah, guiding looks uh, fine. Traffic, yeah. traffic. Are you dithering? Yeah, are you okay. dither guiding or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought you were. I could tell. Yeah. 
So I, I'm not sure how I can work around this because, you know. Wow. Uh, so you get a lot of wind through Rio Vista. I mean, you get a lot of uh, air currents coming through there, right? Oh, yeah. Well, when you, when you get a thousand uh, wind turbines. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, I don't know how you overcome some of that. That's. I know. This is uh, this is the moon. At least I got some. Shorter weapons. focal length. Yeah, but then <laughs> some of the interesting things are smaller. And. Uh, you have less resolution. Yeah. With a shorter focal length. So, yeah, um, so here's M12 again. You know, you know, it's it's pretty much oops, that was I just went through my why is your background so red? Is that the color of your sky up there? I have a camera that doesn't have a um that doesn't have the normal filter in there. Yeah, yeah but I've got that and I've got an unmodified camera. I think it's just background. I have Wait found that yeah. I got a lot of red around the house, but when I went out in the backyard where the observatory platform, it kind of turned the sky to blue. So there could be some kind of ambient radiated light somehow. That's oh, we've got that. LED lights all over the place. Yeah, and I got cameras too, and they have uh, red lights for night vision. So your um, um, if you don't have any filters in there, then you've got big bloated stars because the visible and the infrared are not coming to the same. Point. Oh, I've got an IR uh, UV oh, IR. Got, okay, so it does have a filter in it. Okay. Yeah, so here's never mind. <clears throat> see, again, with even with short exposures, it's sort of like I'm getting. <sighs> I don't know. Do you have I'm the gonna... tell? Do you have the uh, telecompressor for that? Uh, yeah, I have a six point six three. Yeah, I've done. Okay, that. and you I could put it, that thing in there. That would help. It's helped. But for like planetary, nebula, and, and galaxies, um, yeah, you can't get the resolution. Yeah, you know, so, uh, oh well, such as such as life. Anyways, let me just. So, Mike, what's the what's the advantage of the Fast Stone Image Viewer software? It was free, and it seems to work pretty good. <laughs> I do, I, I do have Photoshop, but um, I can't transfer it to my other uh, um, computer. Can so I uh, can I share something? Surely. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a presentation from the 2015 Advanced Imaging Conference by Ken Crawford. It's 58 slides that go in detail. He uses um, different uh, techniques in photos, Photoshop. He's trying to t explain the difference between good data and bad data. <laughs> There's, uh, and he goes through quite detailed stuff. And I just emailed this slide presentation to all of you. So uh, okay. it may take a while to get through, but I think you'll find it interesting based on tonight's uh, yeah. conversation. Thank you. Yeah. So it is copyright to the attendees at the conference, but that's okay. We're in the same club. Just don't share it with anybody else. Don't send it around, put it on okay. Facebook or anything. Okay. So anyway. That's it. So, look at it's interesting. It. It's very detailed. Very good. Okay. We were, somebody was asking about the rig that I used. And so that's it right there. And I wanted to show you, this is the key part right here. There's two nuts. This is your regular tripod nut. And that's the jam nut to keep it from swiveling. Night after night, that thing is in the same place. It's the first time I've been able to stack multi-night 
because this thing's locked in with the guide scope, same guide star to the exact same projection on the image every night. So you don't so, move anything? No, no, you can't. You got a 24 millimeter lens with a fisheye effect. Yeah. You move that lens, you change the projection on the sensor and you're screwed. I can't even get a, a photometric color cow because a photometric color cow requires plate solving and the projection models in Pixar's side are such that they don't have that kind of projection model, uh, so that I can I can figure that out. Uh -huh. you know? So it just doesn't work. And at that right there was a big find for me because I had such trouble with it. You know what happens is um, you'll actually get regions where there are no stars at all. And the reason why is because the projection of the image has changed so much from one frame to the next that one star blacks out another star. So you just get this dark area. So unless you can keep that projection constant throughout the stack, you're in trouble. It's not going to work. Uh, I found that low these low focal length shots are the most difficult shots to do. Uh, you got to have real good sky conditions. I had to throw one night out because of the poor conditions that you have. Uh, and just being, you know, just, just having to deal with that. Imagine doing a mosaic. Oh, my gosh. How would you do star pair matching? You change the projection on the image, see? So you try to put those together. You better have a lot of overlap. I'd say at least 50%. And you better crop the crap out. So you don't have the edge effects of the optics dealing to deal with as well. It's quite it's quite a challenge. Uh, I always thought lower the focal length that you'd be uh, in in like Flint, and now it's turning out to be the most difficult thing I've ever done. Hmm. Maybe the, the a regular lens or a short telephoto probably has less. Of that type of distortion you're talking about compared to well the, i'm not sure exactly how the distortion occurs but i think that any lens uh for especially if you're trying to put an image onto a 35 millimeter and the focal length is less than than that see then mm -hmm. you're going to start to get these distortions so a straight line is no longer a straight line anymore it's a curved line and and so if you change the you know, if you change that perspective, well, then the line changes too. And uh, it, it causes a lot of, of problems. Are you talking fisheye now? It's the, it's about called the fisheye fish effect. Yeah. That's what this is. That's what this is. If okay. you want to read up more about it, that's what I would do a Google search on is the fisheye effect. And so if you know, if you've got a fisheye lens that as you look through it, you're going to get distortions, you know, in the image as you, as you would see it compared to what you would see with your eye, because it's uh, it, it has a different focal length. And so when you look at it, you, you know, you're going to get long, what. Let's say, for example, if you're looking up for rafters with my camera, then then then, the, then they look like there's a curved line of rafters. It's not a straight line because of the projection on the yeah. side with that lens. And so it becomes a real challenge to be able to do this. And to mosaic, it, I'd say that's going to be the supreme challenge of mosaic right there, doing something like that. I had a, I have a Canon F, um, F1, a mm. real one, a film. A camera, classic. A classic. And I've got a couple of Canon lenses still. And one of them is a very special lens. It's a 17 millimeter F4, and it was noted for the fact that it had a very, had virtually no distortion. It was, you know, everything was square. There wasn't a fish eye effect. Yeah, but, at 72 millimeters, you could probably get away with that. But you get those things down there, you know, gosh, seven. it's nice using 10 or 11 millimeters. And you're 17. Like, yeah, 17, you're like, oh, yeah, that ain't going to fly. You're trying to protect 17 millimeters 
on a on an APC size sensor, and you're going to get distortions as a result of doing that. Yeah, I think we're almost to the point now where our sensors are have a small pixel size as the uh, color uh, crystals in the, in the film. Pretty close, getting close to that point you now. I mean, especially like I've got the 178 camera, it's got three micron pixels. So it's three to the four. That's pretty doggone small. So Jerry, Jerry, is that true that so film is is a higher resolution than most of today's uh, sensors? Well, that's yes and no. The the film is a, a chemical, a mixture, it's it's a it's not an orderly. Uh, sensitivity. It's like a network. The uh, chips and the cameras <clears throat> are very orderly and very precise. So the molecules are smaller and you have, because it's the molecules that you're talking to in the film, um, but there is space between them. And in the cameras, you're talking, the digital cameras, you're looking at, um, what is it, uh, etched patterns in it. So the, the, there is a bit of a resolution gain on that for film, but it's way overpowered by the reciprocity failure of the film and the linearity of the um, uh, semiconductor chip. So the advantages lie heavily with the camera, digital cameras. Film is done now usually only as an art because people like the soft tones of it or some other aspect of it. I was talking with uh, Tony Hallis uh, last week, uh, and uh, he's changed his mind as far as sensors is concerned. He How's now that? considers CMOS to be superior to CDs. Huh. Well, several See, people I, have I, changed. I didn't get that. Uh. He, um, he, um, I'm not there yet. CMOS has made a lot of gains in it because they've changed the internal structure of their mm -hmm. uh, preamp on the, in each in each unit cell. The only big difference between uh, CMOS and CCD is that the CMOS has a very fast readout time compared to the CCD. CCD on some things it takes 10 to 15 seconds to read out a single frame. No one's going to use that for home videos of their birthday party or home <laughs> pictures. So um, cameras, yeah. cameras are focused on CMOS, win or lose, no matter what it is. And there's such a big market for that. And they work so hard on it that they've improved the uh, quality of the noise quality of the, um, of the readout. And so it's mm -hmm. not only fast, but it's, it's on a par with CCD now. But usually yeah. the old CCD is, is still the winner. I would like to see the data I know Tony is a very pragmatic empiricist. And uh, if he makes a claim like that, I know he's got data to back it up. So I'd like to see that. He's, he's using the, the, the new uh, QHY410 camera. Okay. Which has got the new Sony sensor and, and it's got yeah. 5.9 microns. Yeah, people are projecting that the CCD will simply go away shortly because they'll be so expensive and the market is shrinking because the CMOS is so more available and it's readily producible. It's a spin-off of the camera market. It's not dedicated mm -hmm. to scientific cameras. And China Yeah, and you know, one of the, the only issues I think remaining with the CCD is its linearity. And, and the CMOS didn't have that linearity. And now they've got the point to the point where the linearity is almost as good as CCD. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I, I, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, if you're doing scientific stuff from your backyard, okay, does it still make sense to get a, a CCD camera or, uh, for photometry and astrometry? Or uh, are they close enough that it doesn't matter anymore? It depends like things that there's a phrase I always like from engineering that better is the um, enemy of good enough. 
And so if you're doing things uh, in your backyard or even for scientific work, if CMOS gives you adequate results, then you have no, even though CTD may be better, there's no incentive for you to go to CTDs. So uh, CMOS is more available and it's definitely cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and Richard Berry showed me that uh, curve where you did a, a, a study type of uh, star where you was able to use the uh, TV scope over a, a nighttime to get the light curve. Pretty nice light curve. So, uh, but again, uh, CCDs. Uh, who who are the people? Who are the people that benefit most by using it? And it, let's say, going out and getting a used CCD camera. You know, right you know your voice is fading away. Oh. Sorry. Okay, let me try and go. Okay, so I'll get a microphone in the room. Um, uh, does it still make sense to get, let's say, an uh, 8300 camera, you know, with an 8300 chip in there or something similar to that? Do scientific stuff, you know, for backyards. Does that still have an advantage over the uh, CMOS cameras now? I, I don't know. I couldn't. I I bought cameras about a decade ago, and I'm happy with the cameras I have. I have two QSIs that are CCDs, and I have um, a two DSLRs I use. One of them is the one that Canon made for astronomy, um, whatever it was, and then I have one uh, a 70D or something like that, and I use those pretty much interchangeably. Um, I tend to use the DSLRs more because they're single shot color. I have a single shot color now with a cooler in it from, I don't know, it's the one Bob uh, Richard had, Richard talked about. I bought it a year ago, but I, two years ago now, but because of COVID, but I haven't used it yet. So um, I'm, the big advantage with DSLR for me is that those are color cameras, single shot color. And I like doing that well. But the frustrating thing about DSLRs is that the, the temperature is not controlled. And so you, I really get tangled up in, in doing dark frames subtraction because the dark frame has to be at exactly the same temperature as the uh, light frame. And you don't have any control over the temperature. The temperature inside the camera will change depending on how many pictures you've taken mm -hmm. and what the night ambient is. So, and you can't tell, you don't have a readout for that. And, so um, it, and it's more sensitive, like when you, when you do a dark frame, you try to get it at exactly the same exposure time as you do for the light frame. But, and so if you're off say by 20% in your exposure time, you take dark frames at 20% of different exposure time, you get a significant error in what you're subtracting out of your frame. Well, if you take um, the camera and you take the dark frame at three quarters of a degree different temperature, you get an error that's equivalent to 20% difference in the exposure time. Because the exposure time is linear, what you get. The, um, the, uh, um, ex the temperature is exponential uh, dependence on brightness. So the dark current roars up and down by a small amount that's just enough to leave all those little black spots in your image where you thought you were just taking out the bright spots, but you overtook them out. And so now they're black spots, which is just as damaging. So I tend to, and so that's why I got the single shot color from Iowa, I, IWA, something or anyway, whatever it is. And so that I'm looking forward to using. I'm getting my telescope together tonight. I would be out there except for this but I'll be out there tomorrow night for the first time using that camera. So I'm good. Good show us the results. I will. That's, that's, that's cool. Well, the, the CDS uh, 600, that's basically a DLSR that's temperature cool, but it's not controlled by DLSR. Yeah. Do you see them, Jerry, do you, do you see the CMOS cameras making those adjustments in temperature control? In the near future? No, no, the CCD is temperature controlled as a rule. 
but I mean the sea moss that you were talking oh, about. They don't. Yeah, you can no, you, you can get you can get sea moss. Those telescope, those cameras that are made for astronomical imaging are temperature controlled. The um, one QHY. Are, what's that? Like the QHY, they should yeah. be temperature controlled. Yeah, and but the thing that's not yeah. temperature controlled is the DSLR, because that's okay. to just shoot around pictures of the campsite. And you're kind of using it for astron astronomy, and which and it's good enough. It shows good pictures, yeah. but I get irritated then, when I process them because I can find all the defects in them. The ATAC horizon the that I've been using is is temperature control. Yeah, and it's CMOS camera. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's no reason you can't put that in there. When I was in high school, just a little back backlog thing. I was an art major before I became a physics major, and I was working on watercolors mostly. And I would get so angry at the painting I would do. I get so intense, you know, they couldn't stand it. And so finally, I just throw the thing away and stuff because I couldn't control the color well. And then later, I'd go back and I'd find it and I'd go, oh, this is a good picture. You know, I wonder why did I throw that away for? And I start looking at it and I go, oh, and I start seeing all my little defects again. And that's what I do when I process these astronomical images. And it makes me mad again. I can't control it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the only one. <laughs> the obsessive compulsive disorder here. <laughs> Whatever it is. I always like that guy that named his telescope <laughs> obsession. Yeah. <right. laughs> Listen, you can get you can really get some OC, OCD stuff going with some of this stuff, you know. Yep. Yes. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with it. If you enjoy it, go for it. Yeah, if you're enjoying it. it yeah, it's that's that's the key. <laughs> uh, I, I um, <laughs> speaking about imaging and uh, being obsessive. I've always tried not to go through away any data, you know, from years past. And I I just got myself a little bit of insurance for a couple of years, uh, a five terabyte drive, and uh, so. Uh, Holy cow! That's five terabytes. Five terabytes. Wow. Um, and. Uh, the, the problem is it's only going to last about a, another one or two more years because I'll be filling <laughs> it up, especially, well, hey, don't laugh. You know, Jupiter's out there now. So yeah. with my 178, it's not yeah. it's not hard to to throw three or four gigabytes on uh, a drive, you know. Hey, in the early the, 80s, when, uh, when we got our first, um, what is it, Mac 2 or something or Apple? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I got uh, an extended memory. I had uh, 20, what was it? 20 megabytes of memory, out yeah, uh, external is. memory. And I yeah. thought, I started saving documents. And I thought, it, geez, essentially, this is, a, this is an infinite storage medium. I'm never going to fill this up. I have yeah. pictures that are bigger than that now. Yeah, yeah we have 32 megabytes. It was huge. Yeah. <laughs> My Insight 8080 had 256 bytes of memory. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, back yeah. in graduate school at UCLA, we had a PDP-11 or something, and then we went, we saw this ad in Sky, a Scientific American for a memory board that would fit in there by Plessy in England, and they, they advertised 128K of memory, and we thought, this is just outrageous, they can't, they can't this must be a trick ad, it's a scam, but we sent off for it, <laughs> it and it worked. Last yeah. year. Uh, Probably was ten thousand dollars. Probably, I think <laughs> yeah. it was. Yeah. Last year, in 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 pics and site files and and stacking, one point six terabytes. Wow, that's why I bought that drive because I was I actually had a two terabyte drive in my my laptop. Uh huh. I have been having to take things off of it. I got a Synology. Uh, Ten, uh, they're ten terabyte drive, two ten terabyte drives near grade one configuration, and mm -hmm. I really like the system quite a bit. Uh, so I use that for surveillance and for you know uh, network storage. I feel like a second class citizen with my one terabyte. <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you connect? How do you connect those to your to your computers at a USB? Uh, USB? Yeah. It looks like it's a USB C, something like that. Oh, the little one. Whatever cable they have with it. 
and then I hook it on the, a USB that's the, port on my that's computer. The, that's the little USB. Yeah. The only thing. God, that, that, the only thing. Unbelievable. About, yeah. The <laughs> only thing about this 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 five terabyte drive was that it took about four hours to take the the, the data off my computer and put it on here because. Um, <laughs> If he, yeah, this is a spinning. Yeah. This is a spinning drive. It's not a solid state. Drive. I don't. I don't believe it. You can't get that in there. That spinning drive. Mine's a solid state. This is. A, this is. A, wow. This is five I'm terabytes. Impressed. Okay. I've got, a, I've got. I've got a one terabyte like what you have, but I ran, of, I ran out of. I ran out of. Storage. Yeah, ran out of storage. If you use a USB three, uh, port, not the standard USB two. It'll cut that time by eighty or ninety percent to store. Well, this is a spinning transfer. drive, so I don't think it's probably spinning that fast. Yeah, I'm I'm doing it to a solid state device. Yeah, I it's different. That's a lot time. faster. Solid state. Yeah, it is. But the reason why I got this one here is that spinning drives still are more reliable than uh, than uh, uh, solid state drives right now. So my uh, experience was I had a what a half a terabyte drive, brand new, and I dropped it, it slipped out of my hand and it landed on a hardwood floor and it never worked again. Okay. <laughs> hey guys, I gotta leave early, sorry. Okay. We'll see you next time. Okay. Bye, Bye guys. Tim. Okay, Tim, we'll see you later. So that drive you dropped, Jerry, was that, was that a mechanical or is that a... No, it was uh, a spinner. It was, it was a spinner, yeah. Spin. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, the All solid right. state well, one I've, I've dropped and they've never... Yeah, you shouldn't, yeah. It shouldn't have a solid state, yeah. But they do, some of them do have a limited number of read-write cycles and you start running out of space. And some of the early Teslas had SSD drives built into them and they're failing now, the, the, the uh, main right. computer. So they have to go in and get a, a new drive put in. Interesting, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't t intend to uh, use this that much. You know, I'll hook it up to my computer once every couple of months and download, you know, try, try and keep the, uh, the, the, the laptops uh, from starving for memory. And I, I actually keep it in a drawer here where I just take the, the lead out, and just stick it into the drive, you know, right next to there. So it, it never moves. Hmm. Hmm. If, if it was a, if, if I were to okay, be well, let this me, I'm going to check out here. Yeah, yeah. me too. Let me, uh, let, okay. let me know if you have trouble getting the email, the PowerPoint that I sent you guys. Well, thank yeah. you very much, Jerry. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jerry. See you later. Thank you. Bye, okay. buddy. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I'm going to be headed out too. We'll see y'all later. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye bye.